Hey, the internet, how's it going? Welcome to the Bell of Lost Souls uh, RPG Corner. Uh, I'm JR, your friendly neighborhood Fungin Master. And I'm Megan. That's it. No <laughs> We're the RPG team here at Bulls, uh, and we are uh, here today to talk about what's going on in the world of role-playing games. And right now, one of the biggest things and it is... it feels like there's a ton going on right now. Yeah. There is a ton going on right now. One of the th the, the biggest things that happened over the weekend was D and D Celebration 2020. This was mm -hmm. a massive uh, live stream virtual event uh, that featured streamers, podcasters, uh, and like panelists talking about D and D, playing D and D, or uh, previewing things from the future of D and D. Um, you can, if you missed it, watch pretty much all of the stuff that happened live on the D and D Celebration YouTube playlist, which is out mm -hmm. now. Because you know it is a, a meme these days that everyone's just going to go check the VOD, I'd, uh, and uh, you, you may as well. Yeah, is um, is what they have archived up online to watch for free, or is that something you need to to pay no, a premium for? To just go, catch go, up on. go to the the D and D uh, YouTube page. And uh, check out, you can you can find panels for anything that you want, whether it is a streamed game or an advice panel, like how to break into D&D, &D, or, you know, getting started writing your own stuff. That's uh, awesome. I know there were some awesome panels with just some top-notch DMs that oh, were absolutely. talking about how they do their thing, and there were a ton of announcements. So even if you did miss it, it's very worth spending the week going through it slowly, so you don't you know, spend all weekend not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, there, so um, we had a lot of uh, big news come out over the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that they did were, was they had like this big interactive map that you can search around and click on and hidden in the map were puzzles. And uh, it was not long before people figured that out and then started solving the puzzles and posting the things up online for anyone to find. Uh, I solved a couple of the puzzles myself. Uh, and uh, they revealed previews of things to come. So we got to look at, at some things that'll be appearing in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, including uh, there were previews of two new subclasses, the Wild Magic Barbarian, or Wild Soul Barbarian, which was misprinted as the Wild Magic Barbarian in the preview, and the Genie Patron Warlock. Um, right. Both of these were subclasses that we'd seen before, or archetypes uh, in uh, ta uh, in Unearthed Arcana, and now uh, they are officially confirmed to be in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Uh, and, and But not only are they confirmed, we got to look at exactly how they're going to be. Um, the Genie Patron Warlock is pretty much exactly as it was in, in the Unearthed Arcana, so you can go get a look at that right now, even if you didn't check out the D&D the celebration. Uh, but then uh, the Wild soul barbarian had been significantly overhauled with a number of their abilities kind of buffed uh so they do a little more damage they have a little more like control over what their wild surge does and all around uh it, it seems like the revisions kind of are pushing the classes to be more fun to play yes and that sounds super fun barbarian isn't normally my jam exactly but this play on a barbarian seems very very fun and very playable yeah, um, especially for somebody like me, who that's not normally what they would go for. Although now that you said wild magic barbarian, that's all I can think of. Right, and that's hilarious. I want to <laughs> want to see someone do that. They they like. I mean, every time you rage, you have like a mini wild magic surge that just has all awesome options to pick from. So you sure. never know what you're gonna get, but it's Being always incredible. gonna be something fun. That would yeah. be horrifying and incredible. My brother yeah. would play that, and he would make me suffer. Oh, I'd be amazing. <laughs> Um, other other previews included new spells, which confirmed that psionics are coming back to third mm -hmm. or fifth edition, uh, but they're looking way different than they did in third edition uh, and editions past. Uh, so psionics in the previous editions of the game, if you are not familiar, were always this like weird separate system that either used like points or it had like disciplines and talents that you had to pick from and what you kind of picked determined what you got. Now it's just sort of another power source. Uh, it, it is uh, the the source behind certain spells. It, it kind of is is uh, allows subclasses to do things that you wouldn't expect. So like if you're playing a psychic warrior fighter, um, you can use your psionics to enhance your strikes or something, and it's just sort of a, a an ability like the Eldritch Knight, which uses arcane power to do things. Like it, it's just another flavor for them. Yes. Um, yeah, and that's that's really cool, and I'm glad they're adding it back. I'm not super surprised that it's changed a lot, 
since previous editions, just because mm -hmm. so many things have in the last couple. But no, that's that's a very exciting thing to have back. Um, it's something yeah. kind of like uh, working with some characters. It's, I mean, it'll be interesting to see like how many, I think there's only two or maybe three subclasses in Tasha's mm -hmm. Cauldron of Everything that use it. Um, we'll talk about why that's kind of exciting though in just a minute. Um, but we also got to see what some of the new psionic spells will be like. We got to see Tasha's Mind Whip uh, and the Mind Sliver Cantrip, both of which are uh, psionic spells. They, um, they do different things, uh, the, the Mind Sliver Cantrip does some like a D6 damage and then allows you to, if they fail their save or they subtract a D4 from their next saving throws, you can kind of set yourself up for success. Uh, and the Mind Whip cantrip does all kinds of other cool stuff uh, uh, when, it, when it hits. I think it has like a, not a stunning effect, but like a, a kind of a pseudo stun. Like mm -hmm. you can either take a, a move uh, a, a, an action or a bonus action, which I think is honestly the best way to do something like, you know, being stunned because you don't lose your turn, um, but you you do kind of have to make some tough decisions. No, exactly. And I I personally always hate it when there's an outcome where where my character gets stunned and I just can't do anything for a turn because then I know it's going to be ten minutes while I just sit at the table and go, ugh. Which is and, not fun. Yeah. That's fun for and anybody. Your turn comes around, and you just like roll, roll a <laughs> roll a three, and you're like, "Great, I'll do it again later." <laughs> I'll uh, be also, here, you're... you guys. I'm gonna go get some more snacks. Yes. So I really like that they've um, kind of made these spells very playable and player friendly. So even if you kind of pooch it, you're still you're still in the game. You're still playing a game. Exactly. Um, then, uh, so the reason that psionics are exciting is because I think the, the biggest bombshell from the D and D celebration is that three classic settings are coming back, uh, to D and D. So these are three settings from D and D's past specifically, uh, that will be updated and released over the next year or two. There was a panel called inside the D and D studio, uh, during which, uh, uh, Ray Winninger and Lisa Schul, uh, two of the top heads of D&D. &D. Uh, I think Ray Winninger is the new um, uh, uh, executive producer of D&D, &D, basically. Uh, they revealed that they have been hard at work on and and listening to fans clamoring for more settings. One of the things they, they are doing kind of is, as their next, like, you know, now that fifth edition is five or six years old, uh, they're, they're looking at what the next five years look like. And that is apparently going to have a lot more emphasis on setting. Uh, we've seen a trend starting towards that with this year. Uh, they've already released two different setting books. There's the uh, Explorers and Wildmount and the Mythic Odysseys of Theros, both of which are new settings to D&D. So you have Critical Role's world, um, Featuring both, uh, uh, well, featuring Wildmount, really, not Exandria. Uh, and uh, you have Theros, which is a Magic the Gathering uh, expansion thing. Um, uh, although now D&D uh, &D is kind of feeding back into Magic the Gathering, uh, side note, with some with some new Magic the Gathering themed D&D &D sets that will be coming out next year as well. And it's all, it's all a, a circle. But... Uh, what's interesting to us is there are three classic D and D settings that are being uh, re-released, and uh, people are abuzz with thoughts of what they might be and what we might get to see. Mm -hmm. uh, rumor has it that uh, Dark Sun is is one of the strong contenders, and that's because we've seen a lot of psionics. Uh, in the past, Wizards of the Coast have said that they don't want to really do psionics unless they had a reason to. And for them, a reason meant like somewhere to like locate psionics in the game. And it wasn't really a Forgotten Realms thing, which like that's that's their words. They're like, it doesn't really kind of fit in here normally. So we were thinking about how we would introduce that. And that means finding a place for it. And then they released Eberron and we got Warforged. And now, uh, and the Artificer, which is being reprinted in Tasha's Cauldron, and now uh, Tasha's Cauldron, which features psionics, kind of is leading a lot of people to think, oh, well, maybe we'll see a Dark Sun guide. Uh, that's something that a lot of people have been clamoring for since the release of 5th edition. That would be really cool. And it, yeah. would, it would be a really good way to kind of to loop psionics into the greater world and just, I guess, um, for more more just general world building for D&D. &D. Yeah, Maybe I think like so. A bigger and bigger globe. 
Yeah, if you're unfamiliar, Dark Sun is like the the post-apocalyptic D and D setting. Everything kind of is a, a blasted desert world uh, where where arcane magic has drained the life force from everything. So there's not a lot of plants. That's why everything's a wasteland. Um, but psionics kind of rose up in response and are like the safe magic to use. Um, so that's uh, people are looking forward to it. There was a lot of classic D&D stuff from there. Uh, in third edition, the Thrykreen were one of the most, like, uh, I don't want to say broken uh, uh, options, but they were used in a lot of the min-max builds to be like, I have a monk that's hitting you 57 times in a turn. Wee! <laughs> that's fun. Hooray! Yeah, uh, but a new setting does mean a new option for new, like, uh, new playable creatures, new subclasses, new things like that. Uh, other yeah. settings that are on high on the list include things like uh, Planescape uh, and Spelljammer. Uh, Spelljammer has been featured in a lot of D and D books so far. You can find Spelljamming ships in everything from uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage to uh, the upcoming Ice or the newly out Icewind Dale Run and the Frost Maiden. You can find a Crash Nautiloid ship uh, inhabited by no mind flayers armed with laser pistols. Uh, so people think that that might be a good setting book. It's also kind of an argument against it since Spelljammer is everywhere, but who knows? Uh, and then Planescape, which is uh, one of the more like unique D and D settings. It, it takes place inside sort of the, the multiverse and uh, D and D has a lot of planar shenanigans. So having a setting book to handle all of that seems like a good move for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know what are some of your favorite settings from out of D and D's past I'm not sure. Um, this is this is a little bit of a cop out, but I think some of my favorite settings are ones that aren't really official to D and D. Uh, I really mm -hmm. like some homebrew stuff that podcasts have come up with, or <laughs> which which does feel like a super big cop out. But just when somebody's like, I don't know, I've made my own world, and we're going to put magic in it. I guess we're going to use these rules. Those are always very very cool and fun to me, just because they're different and they're a little bit unique. I well, do... what makes? Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. What makes a good setting then? Like what makes something like interesting? What what captures your attention? You know, if, if you're designing a new setting, what how, how are you gonna what would you do to hook in people? I'd make it I, I think settings are are the most fun when they're just relatable enough mm -hmm. to like us regular schlubs who don't use magic in our real lives. Like if you can, if you can easily imagine it, and it's not that far out of the realm of of what you're you're able to picture, I think it's really really cool. Which is one of the reasons I think I like um, the uh, I'm blanking on it now. The um, I've forgotten the name of the system because I'm my brain is turned off for a moment. But um, oh. magic takes place in the modern world, or I guess the slightly f uh, future world. Shadowrun. Shadowrun. Thank you. I. Listen to so many Shadowrun podcasts, and I forgot the name of Shadowrun. Yes, but I love um, that as a setting because it's very mm -hmm. easy to picture, but it's also very, very different. Um, but I'm also I'm also really excited by uh, the the new settings that they're adding to D and or not the new settings, but the the settings they're bringing back to D and D right now. I think the idea of like Dungeons and Dragons, but also post apocalyptic, is very interesting and is a cool thing to add to its timeline or to add back to the timeline. Uh, I, I think so as well. I'm, I'm excited. If it were me, uh, I would probably want to see, you know, one of those three and then one of the, the more like cool ones that, that, you know, D and or TSR never did too much with like uh Mistaro or birthright or something like that kind of come back with a, with a new fresh fifth edition take. Um, I am also excited to see like what those books look like and uh, what that means for D&D going forward. Because I think D&D Celebration mm -hmm. was also all about like, here's what we're doing going forward. Here's kind of what you can expect. Uh, in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, we're seeing a lot more flexibility and a lot more like higher level concept stuff kind of condensed down to four lower level adventures. Because we know that most adventures kind of peter out by the time you get to 10th level. No one really yeah. kind of plays though that like last half of the game. Um, 
which is which is real interesting right like it's 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 like well you know if, if this is where everything stops why 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 have that stuff but i think it's kind of a, an interesting balancing act uh we're starting to see a little more high level stuff come out uh that was the subject of one of the panels which was uh designing an inclusive dungeon which featured an all a, a, a cast of all disabled D, &D designers uh including uh, Sarah Thompson, aka Mustang's Art, the designer of the combat wheelchair that sparked a lot of controversy mm -hmm. over the last couple of weeks, uh, and I think is still kind of ongoing. Um, this was a magical wheelchair that you could just use if you wanted to play a, um, a disabled hero. Uh, it was a free homebrew thing that, once it was released, got the creator death threats. So, uh, you know, that's, that's always fun. Um, but... Uh, they designed on panel, uh, sort of in front of everyone, this a more inclusive dungeon, uh, focusing on accessibility and kind of representing disabled folks in the uh, uh, like both in the fiction and in like the considerations that you would have to making your own dungeon. So like you have you know a dungeon with an elevator for like a sphinx. Uh, I think the mission was to go retrieve a special cane for a blind rogue who had left it behind on their last mission. Uh, that's um, I love where where D and D is kind of going with accessibility mm -hmm. and with very very purposefully, well maybe not D and D but where the community is going, um, yeah. With with kind of making the world uh, a place where everybody goes on adventures. Exactly. Um, I think I think it's an interesting line to to uh, draw as as they go forward because I I think um, you know we've we've talked about over the last couple of months how D D has kind of grappled with all of these issues of uh trying to get their their words uh to actions they they made this big promise about making D, &D more diverse and inclusive uh and instead uh, uh kind of had a number of rakes that they stepped on where they like uh got called out for mistreating their employees of color and had uh some, some like uh, controversy around stuff that was on sale on the DM Guild, um, but now it seems like they're trying to kind of stick to their their plan and uh, follow up their 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 promises with actions, which is which yes. is pretty cool. It feels very much like they were going through growing pains and they were kind of making a lot of the same mistakes that a lot of people make when they're mm -hmm. trying to do better, but just keep on running into their own privilege wall. Mm -hmm. And that's a wall that I've run into a number of times, and you've just kind of got to fall over and brush yourself off and uh, try again. Try again, and yeah. Do a better job. And there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with growing and learning. It's just no. a matter whether or not you stop at that wall or you or you you kind of keep pushing it. through. Yeah, and like and, that that's the wor that's work that you have to keep doing. Um, but it seems for now at least like they're they're continuing to do it. Uh, one of the other big panels that was featured on the like finale day like right near the the closing ceremonies was a podcast from uh, Asians represent uh, this is weaving Asian stories uh, which is talking about uh, kind of both being critical of uh, things like uh, Oriental adventures and Alcadim and also talking about ways to include that kind of material in uh, in the future without uh, you know without appropriating the culture without making it this like one note pastiche of like well everything fantasy asia is here so that means china japan and for a lot of people that's where it stops but there's also vietnam korea uh uh thailand a lot of other cultures to draw from and and uh, uh be inspired by but uh it's it's tricky to write that stuff if that's not your culture. So they were kind of talking about ways to explore that, ways to research, uh, and uh, of course, uh, talk about how one of the best ways to see more of that is to have more uh, people of uh, diverse backgrounds on your like writing team or on your executive team making kind of the decisions behind everything. Yes, which is, of course, going to be the best way of making sure that your story is accurate and mm -hmm. um, kind of within the right, within the, within the spirit of the story you're trying to draw from, as opposed to becoming accidentally a character of, of what you're trying to make. And um, that's a tight rope, tight rope to walk, but it's, it's something you can, you can do right if you put in, especially a big company like, um, like Watsi can definitely do the work and do that right. They just need to do it. Yeah. 
And uh, one of the uh, more recent things they've been hiring for is a, a senior manager for diversity, equity, and inclusivity. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see what comes of that. It feels like we're going to see in like two years the 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 consequences of what's been done now, and then two years beyond, we'll kind of see where they're they're growing as as we kind of catch up. Um, it'll be real interesting to see like how that's done in the setting books. Um, we know that they're kind of making a return to Ravenloft in in the very near future uh, with another updated look at the Vistani, and uh, I think I think that's kind of going to be like a good bellwether for what the future holds. Yes. And um, this is this is something really minor that I wanted to bring up from D&D yeah. um, uh, &D celebration. But I don't know if everybody in the stream knows, it was a little bit of a charity event where they were raising money for um, a couple of charities. And they raised, I'm looking at the site, about $240,000, which wow. is not any, something to sneeze at. Um, <laughs> Um, it looks like they're still going if anybody wanted to buy, I guess, merch to go towards um, that cause. But I thought that was really cool that, um, you know, it's D&D &D for good. Awesome. Uh, that was D&D &D celebration and is pretty much everything on the D&D &D front. A few other big things are happening. Uh, Pathfinder announced a, at during PAX last week a number of books that will be going to the Milwaukee Expanse. That's uh, the fantasy Africa-inspired um, region of uh, Pathfinder's world of Galerion, uh, including a new adventure path that is a sort of a magic school-themed adventure path. So you, you can play students who kind of advance through, I think the, the game play spans five years in game. Um, so you you like go to, go to magic school, get a magic degree. Uh, that's pretty exciting. That won't come out till next year, but we're excited to see what that looks like. Uh, Cyberpunk Red uh, put out an announcement, a release that said that they have, uh, despite delays, the book is fully written and is going through the final round of editings right, uh, editing right now. Uh, and um, it's kind of grown a lot in scope, especially with the uh, release, uh, upcoming release of Cyberpunk 2077 by CD Projekt Red. Um, the, uh, so that should be out soon. Um, it's still in the when it's ready release date uh, mode because they're they're still waiting to see what the um, what the editing looks like. But they hope that it will be out sometime by the end of this year, uh, or or hopefully if if not soon next year. I feel like everything is kind of in that weird. It will be ready when it's ready kind of limbo. Yeah, of where we're all at right now and. That's all right. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a kind of good note to end on. Everything will be ready when it's ready. And we'll be ready to do this again next week. Uh, so be sure and check back next Tuesday for another update of all the goings on in the tabletop world. Uh, and join us on Monday for the tabletop hour where we talk about everything going on in the uh, miniatures wargaming world. Uh, and check out our Twitch stream for cool paint tutorials and paint along projects and fun times with uh, some of our favorite people. Uh, in the meantime, I've been JR. I'm Megan. And uh, we'll see y'all next time. Mm.